The Neptune Project, in partnership with the National Science Foundation, the W.M. Keck Foundation, the University of Washington, the Pacific Northwest Gigapod, and the Research Channel, is proud to present Visions 05, Expedition to the Underwater Volcanoes of the Northeast Pacific. My name is John Delaney and I'm a marine geologist and we're at sea off the coast of Washington and Oregon. One of the key things you can see behind me is the ocean and it's fairly placid. Uh, we have indications that within the next day or day and a half that we will have a very serious storm blowing through and so we're stepping our program forward uh, about a day uh, to bring to you some phenomenal images from the sea floor. Before we go too far into this discussion, however, I want to sort of introduce some of you that, to the concept of what it is about the oceans that is so fascinating to all of us. The oceans in many ways are the, are the flywheel of the environmental climate, the planetary climate. And, and because of that, they're extremely important. We have to understand the oceans in many different ways. And what you're going to hear from us today and you'll, over the next half decade to decade, will be the story that we're shifting from the way we have been doing oceanography to the way we will be doing oceanography. So in many ways, we're at the cusp of this transformation or this, this change in our field. The ocean itself actually is driven from the external force of the sun, that is the energy from the sun basically drives the wind and the waves, the interface between the way the atmosphere works and the way the ocean works is very much a function of how the sun works. If you look carefully, the earth, the oceans are driven largely by the energy of the sun and the energy of the interior. Now, let's look at all the kinds of processes that operate in the ocean. If you look at uh, all the processes from the water air interface down deeper and deeper and deeper, you see that there are many, many tens, in fact, there are hundreds of processes that operate, and they all interoperate, and that's extremely important because we don't understand many of the individual processes, and we certainly don't understand how they interact. Toward the deeper part, the influence of the heat from inside the Earth becomes much more prominent, and what we're doing out here today, uh, and this cruise, this Visions 05 cruise, is trying to bring you to the sea floor to show you some of the consequences of that internal source of energy. And this is going to be very exciting. Uh, I, I believe you're going to really enjoy what we're about to do next. The, the, the bottom line here is that when you get to the sea floor, mostly it looks like a barren uh, desert. But the fact of the matter is there are some oases discovered by a number of folks uh, 20, 30 years ago that are driven by hydrothermal heat, that is heat from the deep interior. That heat actually creates an environment in which chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis, drives the basic life force. And we will be looking right over the place where the seafloor pulls apart at about the speed your fingernails grow, uh, and there's magma, molten rock, from below the seafloor that wells up into that potential void and, and results in lava flows flowing out all over the seafloor in the vicinity of these spreading centers, these places where the plates come apart. Where that happens, there is a, an interaction between the overlying very cold ocean, it might be two degrees centigrade, very chilly, and the underlying warm, and in some cases extremely warm, very hot, uh, near surface crust below the seafloor. When that happens, the water circulates, much like a convection cell of, of any sort, and the top of those convection cells represents the outflow of very, very hot water that is charged with fluids, or charged with minerals in solution that have been picked up from moving through 
the walls and the fractures below the sea floor. That's what we're here to study. That's a very, very small part of the overall program of what an ocean is about. It is one of perhaps 50 major processes. The reason that we're so excited about it is that we believe that by studying that part of the ocean, we're gaining insights that we can get in no other way actually about how other planets might actually either initiate or support life. How are we doing this? How can we bring this to you from out in the ocean? We're at least, we're at least 250 miles from land, all right? So how do we do this? Well, if you were to look at the overall picture, we have a robot on the seafloor called Jason. Jason is attached to its partner, Medea. These are systems that were originally explored by Bob Ballard and developed with his colleagues uh, as much as 30 years ago. They are attached to the ship. We're standing on the, the research vessel Thompson, operated by the University of Washington, funded by NSF. We're standing on board there, and we're looking at the top of the ocean. And so the communications with the robot on the seafloor is through a fiber optic cable. That theme of fiber optic cable will come back to. The fiber comes on board and it is the signals that come from the seafloor are transmitted through a satellite up to, in, in this case, the Galaxy 10R satellite. It's, I understand from my colleagues, Mike Wellings and others, that it's a fairly hot bird. I think that's the term they use. Anyway, we are using the, the satellite to beam a signal at about 20 megabits per second to the top of Kane Hall on the University of Washington campus. And there, it's picked up by the folks in the studio. Mike and his colleagues, uh, Jamie Alls and others, are there standing by to take that signal and basically relay it all the way down the West Coast through something that the, uh, the computer and communication scientists refer to as the National Lambda Rail, where they can actually put as much as a gigabit uh, uh, data on each wavelength of the light that goes down this fiber optic cable down the West Coast. We also have an exquisite little autonomous vehicle known as AID, Autonomous Benthic Explorer. And that, that uh, Dana Yerger and his team from Woods Hole are operating that. And so it frequently is out away from the ship doing its job mapping the seafloor while we're here using Jason on board. This is also very exciting and it's a glimpse of the future. So our colleagues at Woods Hole have done a wonderful job of setting us up with the capability of using Jason and Abe. Now, what I'd like to do is transition from here into the van, the control van, which is behind me on, around, uh, around forward, and we'll join uh, my colleague Debbie Kelly and, and take a look at what's going on on the seafloor. The, the key that I want to bring to your attention is that on the seafloor, we have an incredible camera, and, and that incredible camera is produced by Insight Pacific, and it is a high-definition camera that has the capacity to go through a wide variety of zoom levels and produce images that are, are absolutely unparalleled. Now, may I introduce my close and good colleague and longtime friend, Deborah Kelly, who is sitting here in front of me. Uh, Debbie is one of the researchers that uh, has been involved with us uh, for years, and she has major programs doing research out, her, out here. Her colleague on my left is Peter Gerges from Harvard University, and Peter arrived late last night uh, in a, a, I won't call it a gale, but it was a, a bit of a stirring uh, transfer uh, at night to get on board to be with us today. So I'm going to transfer then to Deb, and Deb and Peter will talk to you a bit about what's going on on the seafloor and the kinds of experiments that we're actually conducting in real time while this video uh, conferencing with you is going on. Deb? Sure. So one of the things that uh, there's a lot of interest in right now is what the most extreme environment is that life can live on on the planet as well as other planets. And so one of the experiments that we've designed here is to try and get access to the insides of black smoker chimneys. And the reason that we've picked these environments is that black smokers turn out to be one of the most extreme environments on the planet. Uh, they emit fluids that are temperatures up to 700, 750 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And they are bounded, the outside walls of these chimneys, their metal sulfide chimneys, are bounded by cold seawater. In this environment where we are at 7,000 feet uh, beneath the surface of the ocean, the fluids are about 2 degrees centigrade, so almost freezing seawater. And so between the chimney wall that has 2 degrees oxygenated seawater and the high temperature, 700 degree uh, Fahrenheit, oxygen, very oxygen poor fluids that are very rich in uh, magmatic gases, somewhere between those, those walls we uh, think is the upper temperature, the, the boundary conditions that determines where the most extreme conditions that life can live on the planet. So we picked up this environment to design in situ experiments where we actually drill holes into the walls of these chimneys and put incubators, microbial incubators, inside the walls that have multiple kinds of chemical and thermal sensors. And the idea is that we can leave these experiments in place on the seafloor. Uh, right now they're run by batteries and they have uh, separate data loggers, but eventually what we'd like to do is transition these instruments onto Neptune where we can actually interact with the experiments. We can inject different kinds of chemicals, we can monitor the temperature, and we can really interact with the environment. So right now what we have on the sea floor is we're located in the main endeavor field. Uh, it's a water depth of about 2200 meters. And um, we've actually, uh, early on about a month ago, we drilled into the walls of one of these chimneys called Gremlin, which is that, the, the actual structure that we're sitting at right now. And we emplaced one of these microbial incubators. Uh, it actually turned into a little bit of a black smoker when we uh, drilled the hole. We put the, the microbial the incubator inside the wall. It's an absolutely gorgeous environment to work in. Uh, it's a, kind of a small mounded chimney uh, and it's covered completely. What we're looking at right now is the incubator inside the chimney, but on the top of it, this mound is thousands of animals that actually use the microbes, that uh, some of the kinds of microbes in their systems to help process the nutrients. So what we're going to be doing later on, uh, probably tomorrow, is looking at one of these incubators in Gremlin and perhaps pull it out and put a new incubator back in. When we recover these incubators, uh, we have the entire temperature record as well as some of the chemistry of the fluids. And then we can look at the conditions, the actual conditions inside the chimneys that these microorganisms uh, experience. It turns out that the highest temperature organism on Earth is from a, a hydrothermal chimney just a, a couple hundred or about uh, two kilometers away from here. And we're really trying to look at what kinds of organisms, how they thrive uh, and, and what, what conditions they live under and how they interact with each other, which we really don't have very much information about. Uh, my colleague here, Peter Gerges, is an expert on some of the larger animals that grow in these environments. And he's a co-PI through this National Science Foundation program to look at the extreme conditions under which life can live on. So Pete, you might want to share a little bit. Sure. Thanks, Deb. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you out there watching wherever you may be. Um, Deb's giving you a great introduction into the environment uh, that we are studying here. And some of you may be asking, you know, why study this? Well, what's really unique about these environments is that it's a situation where the organisms that are growing there are dependent entirely on the chemistry and the rocks. I mean, a lot of times, even we scientists just think of rocks as things, you know, we build houses on or, or uh, I don't know, uh, crush up in, to make a, a pavement or a driveway or whatever, right? We don't think of them as interacting with life. And in these environments, they intimately interact with life. And a lot of these hydrothermal vent structures that you're looking at are actually not just uh, uh, a pile of rocks, but a complex like amalgam, right? It's a, it's a, a composite of rocks and microbes. And what we really want to understand is how those microbes make a living in these in the sort of harshest of environments and also how they contribute to the formation of these structures. And that's why we have to do this in a very interdisciplinary fashion. What does that mean? Well, that means that I, as a biologist, have to work closely with chemists and geologists so that we can piece together this puzzle to better understand how this entire ecosystem operates. Now, one of the th uh, things that I've had the privilege of doing is working with John and Deb uh, here at the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And the uh, microbial sulfide incubators were uh, an idea of Deb's where she really wanted to see if we could probe the, the limits of life by using these uh, instruments. And um, we've had great success so far. And one of the exciting things that's, that's going to happen is we're going to recover these and look at not only where the microbes are growing, but how they're interacting with the minerals uh, that we're finding in these environments. So I don't know, Deb, if you wanted to talk a bit more about the, the uh, sulfide structures or? Sure. So uh, one of the things that we're looking in right now is we're zooming in on a sulfide structure, again called Gremlin. It's actually a very small chimney. 
Uh, one of the amazing features of this this field that we're working in called main endeavor field is the structures get incredibly large, up to 25 meters tall, maybe up to oh, 30, 40, 50 meters across. Um, we don't quite know why they get this large in this area. It's a very seismically active area. Uh, there hasn't been volcanism in this area for quite a long time. There's a lot of tectonic activity. And it could be that the seismicity is very, very important in keeping these structures growing for, for quite a long time. Uh, one of the most exciting things to me is there's so many microhabitats in this environment. Uh, from bare rock, in a minute we're going to actually angle around an area that in a meter or so where there's extinct sulfides that are very oxidized, uh, old metal deposits. Um, and just a meter away now we're looking at this environment that's incredibly rich in life. And so it's a big challenge for us as scientists to try and understand all these little environments and it takes a long time to, to do that. So I think what we can do now is we're going to migrate around this chimney. Um, it's not very big, it's only a few meters across maybe four meters tall. And what we'll see is some very old chimneys. Uh, these are very dynamic environments. Um, fluids may, may stay active in one place for a few thousand years, a hundred years. We don't have very good dating yet. Um, but they go through this, this evolution of, of uh, being very vigorously active for a while. And then as the heat source of the plumbing system moves around, they go extinct. Uh, one of the things that we're we're also looking at is trying to understand how these systems act as a whole. And so we've picked this one chimney and we've put a microbial incubator in it. We have another instrument that actually measures temperature, resistivity, and hydrogen in situ. Hydrogen is a very important gas for the microbes. Uh, and we're going to add some more experiments to this site. So try and get a lot of data in one place and kind of use it as a microcosm for the area as a whole. Uh, in a similar way that we might use Neptune, where we look at a, a hydrothermal field, several hydrothermal fields, and then try and get at, um, access of what an entire plate is behaving like. Uh, right now, I think we can uh, switch it over to John, and maybe he can uh, tell a little bit more. We're going to be driving around the side of this old extinct chimney and go to a 300-degree black smoker in just a second. Actually, rather than, uh, rather than that right now, I understand we have just a little bit more time than we originally intended. So... What I really would like to do is have a bit of a dialogue between Peter and Debbie and myself about what we're seeing. As Peter correctly pointed out, we've, we've got in some ways a serious problem because each of us has been trained in a particular discipline. The fact of the matter is nature, particularly nature on the sea floor, uh, involves physics, chemistry, biology, and sometimes psychology. So. So what we really need to do is learn from one another, and this is a perfect laboratory for that sort of cross-disciplinary type of dialogue. So Deb, what we're seeing in front of us is like what's beyond, except that it has stopped uh, venting, right? And it's begun to become uh, uh, colonized by different kinds of animals. So you guys talk a little about what you're seeing so that, that the folks that are watching get a sense of, of how, one, how exciting it is to have this incredible camera which gives us a, a, a visual acuity that is virtually equivalent to what you have when you look across the street at home that's not common for us in the deep sea and and talk you guys i mean it's really cool what you're saying it's cool to me and it's uh, it's very cool um you know one of the interesting things is that uh, if, as a uh, um as a biologist my bias is to towards uh my eyes wander towards the critters and anytime we come across a site like this, I think, oh, wow, look, there's an anemone or a snail. And uh, working with Deb has been a, a fantastic uh, opportunity because uh, while we often sort of poke at each other and say, yeah, I, biologists only deal with the wet and squishy, and, and I'll say, yeah, you guys only deal with rocks and boring things, uh, it gives us an opportunity to think about how, well, that's my, my opinion, right? It gives us an opportunity on how, the, how the, uh, uh, these different uh, components of our planet uh, interact. Sure, so we're looking right now at the contact between very old sulfide. Uh, one of the easy things to, to find in these environments is anywhere where there's active venting or diffuse flow coming out of the chimneys, life takes over almost immediately. So it's, it's one of our exploration guides to look for where there's active venting. Any place there's microbial uh, or organisms growing on the rocks, in dense colonies we know that there's fluids coming out of the rocks. You can think of them as big sponges with lots of fluid flow coming out of them. So we're uh, zooming in right now on an instrument that um, actually uh, measures temperature, hydrogen, and resistivity, or the chlorinity of the fluid 
Uh, it turns out that the salinity of the fluid is of great interest to us because it's actually one of the reasons that uh, metals get carried in solution. So how much salt is in solution governs in part what kind of metals are deposited over time. So we're uh, zooming in on a chimney that uh, it's a, it actually doesn't have much of a sulfide growth on it right now. Uh, we cleaned it away and we have this instrument buried into the kind of the pipe or the orifice of the chimney right now. Um, sure, John. If I can just point out, for those of you that have really noticed uh, and, and have watched very carefully, yes, you are looking at submarine duct tape that is wrapping <laughs> that thing up. We are using every resource we have. <laughs> One of the, the interesting, uh, not problems so much, but uh, we're always fascinated by how, how rapidly life takes over this in the environment. Uh, the instrument that we're looking at was deployed uh, maybe three weeks ago, and already the animals, they love to colonize everything we put out there. So there, we have limpets, uh, thousands of limpets in this area, and they, they migrate in very rapidly to uh, basically use any surface they can to grow on. So um, the, the chimney that we're looking at right now is just a very small orifice, uh, maybe an inch in diameter, and um, there's 300 degree fluid, 300 degree C, so about 700 degree Fahrenheit fluid coming out of this, this little pipe. Uh, buried on the other side of that is where we have the microbial incubator. And so the hope is we've actually taken samples of the black smoker fluid and we've put those in the lab. And um, actually we've had organisms been very successful at culturing, actually growing organisms that were traveling in the fluid uh, through time. So uh, it's a very interesting environment for us. We're gonna, later on, we're gonna move around and actually look at a much larger structure called Hulk. Uh, as an example, this small chimney within this area called the main endeavor field, which is maybe a few football fields in length, uh, we have about 20 of these very large edifices that get up to, oh, maybe 30 meters tall and several hundred of these active black smokers. So this is just one example. It's pretty typical of what we see a little bit lower temperature than some of the other ones, but this, this black rich plume is, is pretty typical. So Pete, do you want to share about some of the animals? Or? Yeah, sure. So one of the other uh, uh, amazing experiences that we have and now that all of you get to have along with us is that whenever we leave something on the seafloor here for just even just a week or two, uh, it's colonized by critters, um, uh, bacterial mats will grow on it. So uh, every day is a new day, and that's the, that's the, the, the wonder of all of this. And now one of the other things that's important to point out is that, again, I want to emphasize the interaction here between the rocks, uh, the animals, and the microbes, and how this, these all uh, function together uh, in, in, in a single unit. So it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to come here and to look at any one particular aspect. And I would be uh, rather foolish as a biologist to say, oh, just go get me some limpets and I'll uh, you know, look at them in the lab. It doesn't work that way. The limpets that you see here that colonize everything do so for a reason. Um, they're grazers. And what they do is much like cows is they just wander around looking for things to graze on. But they don't eat wheat. They eat microbial mats. And so anytime there's a fresh surface where a lot of microbial mats will start to grow, you'll find these limpets move in quickly and begin to mow it down. So it's, it's really a, a really exciting environment to study and a really neat place to watch. One of the things that always surprised me when I first started looking at these environments was that when the fluids come out of the chimneys, uh, they're actually very clear. And then as they mix with the cold seawater very, very rapidly, there's incredibly steep gradients. Uh, this black smoker that we're looking at now, the, the, again, the pipe's about this big. There's 300 degrees C fluid coming out, and basically just within centimeters or millimeters, it entrains huge amounts of seawater, and it, that's what causes this fine-grained metal sulfide to uh, precipitate out, and eventually over time, it will uh, form a large chimney. Again, these, these systems are very, very dynamic. They, we, in one area, we see these very large chimneys, uh, tens of meter sized chimneys that have fallen over, uh, and they can regrow quite rapidly. In another area, we actually surgically remove part of a chimney, about two meters of it, and it's grown back since 1998. It's grown out, grown back about eight meters. So they are a very interesting, dy very dynamic environment that changed rapidly over time. And that's one of the things that we're looking at. We're trying to get these instruments in, let them stay in for a year, several years at a time, and try and understand how, if there's a magmatic event or a tectonic event where we have lots of earthquakes, how it changes the fluid chemistry and how the animals respond to that. We know that, particularly in Maine Endeavor, it's a great place. So in 2000, there was a large 
uh, magnetic event where we had melt, 1200 degree melt intruded under the sea floor, and that produced a lot of gases. Uh, it, it resulted in an increase in temperature of many of the black smokers. And when we came back a few years later, what we saw is huge, huge uh, growth of organisms, animals that had never been on some of the chimneys before. So it's again, one of the things that we're looking at in this environment. Um, I think pretty soon we can migrate out of here and we're gonna go look at the, this large, very large structure called, called Hulk. But one of the really pretty places we can maybe fly kind of angle around this way a little bit, Bob, and then we'll just spend some time looking at some of the, the two worms uh, and limpet colonies. And limpet. while we're doing that, I'll go ahead and um, point out that the uh, probe that Dad Kelly was just telling you about uh, is uh, um, uh, something that Marv Lilly, who's a chemist at the University of Washington, uh, had designed and deployed. And um, much like smoking is bad for us, smoking is pretty bad for a lot of the instruments we put down there. And this is another big challenge. Every time we uh, deploy something, we, we'll, we'll make it out of a material that we think will be able to stand up to the pretty uh, intense chemistry and conditions down there. So remember, the pressure down here is about 4,000 pounds per square inch. Or imagine balancing a, a small car on a square inch rod and putting that on the palm of your hand. I mean, it's, it's a lot of pressure. Uh, the temperatures are, again, uh, hundreds of degrees Celsius and the fluids are very caustic. So sometimes when Marv uh, wants to develop an instrument to look at the chemistry, uh, he finds that he has to experiment with a lot of different materials. So most of what we use is uh, made out of titanium, um, which of course is very expensive, but it's really the best bet for our, for our instrumentation. Um, and a lot of times, Deb, we put things down that just uh, haven't come back the way we'd hoped. So, yeah, one of the, the difficult things and very challenging, the way that we're flying around that um, Bob here is, is pilot right now, and, uh, it looks, he makes it look very easy, but when you think that there's a ship attached to a, a cable that's attached to another vehicle called Medea, and then 7,000 feet down from the ship is what we're looking at now, right now with this vehicle. So there's a lot of very interesting engineering and um, dynamics in terms of technology that lets us do this down here. And uh, we always thank these guys a lot because they do a great job. Um, it's it's uh, easy to get in trouble and. Uh, they, they're really careful and we, we, it lets us do our work. Um, so it's a good challenge for us. So right now we're zooming into this chimney and uh, you can see that the entire mound, it's hard to tell that there's, a, there's an active sulfide deposit underneath it because it's so colonized with these animals. And so we're gonna spend a little time just zooming into one of the more uh, highly colonized areas. And you can see that one of the things that we, uh, the biologists are interested in is these, these chimneys, as they start, one question is, so you have a chimney that's 300 degrees, how do the animals find their way to start colonizing there in the first place? And then as the mineralogy and the chemistry of the chimneys change and the chemistry of the fluids, how do the populations of the organisms change over time? And so one of the things you can look at, just by looking at these chimneys, you, you really see that we're already looking at very different kinds of colonies where we have two worms and snails together and the two worms don't look very happy. In other words, right now where we're looking at, it's a very dense um, growth of limpets and then palm worms. One point that I'd like to make again, which we've, we've all talked about uh, so far, is the amazing quality of the image, the camera that you're seeing. Uh, I regret that, that, that perhaps some of you have standard definition, but we hope that you'll be able uh, soon to be able to pick up uh, the, the, these uh, images uh, in, in high def, uh, high definition. It's, it's truly amazing when you realize that we are looking at something that is two and a half kilometers below sea level and you're watching it in your boardroom or your office room or your convention or wherever you are. Uh, this is a harbinger of what is to come. We will be able to do this routinely in time and we, we look forward to working through that transition. Uh, it wasn't so long ago that when you went to sea, you left the dock, and that was the last anybody heard of you until you came back a month later. Those days, we hope, are largely gone, and we will be able to, in some cases, not even leave the dock and be able to work the seafloor. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Deb, can you just briefly uh, introduce folks here that are that are actually operating uh, the system uh, for us. Sure. Uh, just, uh, I think Bob Waters here and 
he could turn to the camera for a moment and at least see who's actually <laughs> driving this vehicle. Deb? Sure. Yeah, we have uh, Steve here on the right, and uh, Steve's very important in that um, basically there's an interesting dance that goes on between the vehicle and the ship. Uh, so what, what Steve's job is, uh, he actually makes the ship move in concert with the, the vehicles so that you don't end up uh, overrunning the cable. So he, he lets us know where all of our instruments are. He lets us know where the, both the vehicles are. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty challenging uh, job right now. So, but there, everything's all set up. We uh, actually have very, very good navigation down here right now. We can tell within a few meters of where we are. Um, and then Bob is the pilot, uh, and he's been, he'll drive for four hours and then switch out. Uh, everybody switches out every four hours. And he's sort of the control center for the, the, the vehicle. Uh, any of the, the sampling that uh, we need done, uh, there's two different arms on Jason that we can take different kinds of samples with and all the manipulations. Uh, and then for just navigating through this complex territory that we're, we're going through. Uh, and then the other very important job is, is tether management because uh, this thing kind of acts like a piece of spaghetti on a, or a string attached to the ship. And so Tito, uh, to my left here, he really controls the, the cable dynamics, how the tether behaves. Uh, you don't want the two vehicles to get too far out of sync or too far away from the ship. You basically want them pretty much vertical beneath the ship. And so there's always this very interesting dance, particularly when uh, it gets kind of wavy um, and there's uh, uh, you know a lot of surface waves. It's an interesting dance between the different vehicles. And so it's a, it's a real, really uh, important team membership here where everybody works together. Tito, you got to turn and look at the camera for one minute. This, this, this is one of the handsomest engineers in the entire ship. <laughs> who I've had the privilege of saying, sailing with many times at sea. And don't let his gentle disposition fool you. He's a fantastic cameraman <laughs> and uh, 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 really, really wicked with the controls there. Uh, and in, ex in a... In a an expedition like this, you really can't have just one person do everything. And that's why uh, we're really grateful and dependent on all the people in this room to help us fly the vehicle, navigate the vehicle, collect the samples, and uh, collect our beautiful high-definition video. So I don't know, Deb, if you mm -hmm. wanted to say anything else about uh, this particular site here? No, I or? think uh, right now we're going to take a little bit of a meander. And then uh, what we're going to do is turn on this uh, underwater spotlight and that we deployed earlier during the day and take a, lar a look at this very large chimney called Hulk, which is absolutely spectacular uh, with big, huge overlying flanges that have pools of water trapped underneath them, pools of high temperature fluid, we'll and uh, amazing animals that live on top of these flanges and some nice black smokers. So it's a pretty uh, impressive sight to see when we get over there. So uh, we'll, we'll start the meander in just a few minutes. Then. It's gonna take us it's going to take us about 10 or 15 minutes to make that transition. So there are a few more things that we could perhaps talk with you about. But what's going to happen is, this is very important to understand, in order for us to move that 100 foot distance, 100 meter distance, we have to actually move the ship so that Medea, actually, which hangs directly below the ship, actually moves and then Jason can move. So we have to go through that, that evolution. What I'd, what I'd like to do is talk with you then a little bit uh, while we're making that transfer um, about a couple of the big things that we see going on in, in our, our immediate world and then in a broader world. And I'll ask uh, both Deb and Peter uh, to, to chime in. We're very informal here, so, so we are be delighted to have both a dialogue and, uh, and a discussion. The first thing is if you, if you stand way back and you look at the planet, and say you could strip the water off the ocean and you could look uh, sort of at, this, at the age of the sea floor. Uh, one of the images you're looking at right now would, shows you the warm colors are actually the youngest and we're on one of those warm colors. We're right at the, the rocks beneath us are, are probably less than 10,000 years old. Uh, and all around the world there is this pattern of young rocks. Well. The young rocks actually are places where uh, the large tectonic plates are, are literally pulling apart. And the next series of images that you'll see actually show you those plates 
and they will snap onto your screen uh, in sequence and you will see each of the plates in its own color uh, and we will move through a, a sequence of those. Those plates, the way they interact is very, very important. You've all remember the sound or the, the sound, the, the event of the, of the, the big tsunami uh, and the earthquake that went with it. That was the result of one plate moving past another plate and it created a tsunami that killed hundreds of thousands of people. So we tend to think of plate tectonics as being sort of a, a background phenomenon, but in fact it is directly responsible for the mountain systems that we see on our planet. It's directly responsible for the fact that the ocean basins are where they are because they are where plate tectonics pulls the continents apart. So it's, it's quite a profound uh, a process that operates on our planet and it's one that's very difficult to study because it is most dynamic beneath the oceans and the oceans frankly are difficult to see through. Um, it's interesting to realize that the the atmosphere is transparent to light but the ocean is by no means transparent to light and so mapping the sea floor is much more difficult than mapping the surface of Mars. There's somebody with a, 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 an interesting sense of humor said that we ha we know more about the moons behind than the ocean's bottom and that's still true today we have a difficult time unraveling exactly what the shape of the seafloor is and yet that is one of the great hints as to what's going on so we in as as a group uh, the folks you've talked to and the names that have been used earlier and many of our colleagues around the country have been working on a program that has been funded by the the wm keck foundation and it is a five-year, $5 million project that was funded to do the following. And you'll see now in this next minute or two, you'll see why we, all of us, have to work together. It was to look at the effects of plate tectonics, the deformation that takes place, the earthquakes and, the, and even the volcanic activity, what the effects those changes have on the fluid that is down in the fractures that are faulting, that fluid during a fault moves, it squirts basically from where the fault is to someplace else or vice versa into the area of the fault. So the fluid moves. Well, the fluid is in contact with and at high temperatures uh, in contact with the rock that surrounds it. And when the rock surrounding the fluid uh, is subjected to those temperatures, it dissolves. So the fluids then can move chemicals from one place to another. And there are microbes distributed through the cracks and the pores of the rocks and in the deep ocean that are able to make a living off of these fluids that carry these dissolved rock chemicals. Now, Peter talked earlier about uh, chemosynthesis. What we're talking about is a plate tectonic engine that basically generates the, the, uh, the nutrient flux off of which very exotic life forms, we think exotic because we don't see them very often. They're probably the most basic life form on the planet in that many of the things of the microbes that we have begun to culture and look at are called archaea and uh, they I'm told by my colleagues that they date back as much as uh, 350 uh, billion years uh, sorry 3.5 billion years ago and and Peter maybe you'll just chime in here and mention uh, the role that archaea may have played in the evolution of the planet well that's um that's a pretty tall order <laughs> and that's actually that's actually why we're out here. Because, only in a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you how, why it's all important. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Now, Debbie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's the rocks, I tell you. That's right. It's all about the rocks. <laughs> well, but but some of you by this point may actually be asking yourselves, "Wow, boy, that's overwhelming. Uh, how are you going to wrap your head around this, and why why do it?" Well, John just pointed out some very important facts. We live in a world in which everything's interconnected, despite how hard you may want to not believe that. Believe me, there are times where I don't want to believe it. It's just that is just the deal. And for us to understand why we have hurricanes or why we have tornadoes or uh, why the price of salmon goes down and we can have a, a nice salmon dinner really relies on our ability to understand what happens in the ocean. And that's not just from the, on the surface of the ocean, but all the way down to the seafloor. Now, we are, we are exploring a lot here in, on, on, at these hydrothermal vents, not only how these processes uh, uh, influence what happens on the surface, but also um, to try to better understand the history of life or the origins of life. And as John pointed out, our key have been around for a very, very long time. And what we're beginning to find is that there are some uh, basic uh, uh, trends that we see in organisms as we go back in time. Um, 
One of them has to do with this uh, business of chemosynthesis. Now, some of you may ask, well, what is, what's chemosynthesis? Um, I'm sure uh, we're all familiar with plants. Uh, I have a particularly brown thumb, so I can't grow them very well. But those of you out there who are green thumbs uh, know that if you take a plant and you give it a lot of sunlight and a lot of water, that it grows. And the reason it's growing is it's because it's taking carbon dioxide out of the air, which is inorganic carbon. We call that inorganic carbon. It's taking that carbon dioxide and it's making sugars. And that's how it feeds itself. And that's how the plant grows. Well, a lot of these uh, bacteria and archaea do something very similar. In fact, a lot of them are photosynthetic. They take sunlight and they, they convert that into sugars. Uh, others of them uh, will actually use chemical energy. And so they can grow in the absence of sunlight. And that has a lot of um, uh, uh, ramifications for life, life on early Earth. So with that as, uh, as a backdrop, what the Keck Foundation funded us to do was to look at the processes that operate when plates deform, at the processes that operate, that is earthquakes, at the processes that operate when the fluids move, and at the microbes that grow in response to that nutrient flux. So for the last five years, all of us have been looking at the earthquake activity on the, Juan de Fuca, the northern end of the Juan de Fuca plate. And if we have that graphic that we had earlier that shows where the Juan de Fuca plate is, we have another one that follows it that goes right in close on the Juan de Fuca plate. You get to see the plate itself. Uh, and then we can look even more closely at the boundaries of the plate and it's important to realize that a plate has a spreading center boundary where the lava comes out, a subduction zone boundary where the plate plunges beneath the continent, but it's a big earthquake generator, and another boundary called a transform fault where the rocks slip past each other. That's Debbie and Bob Ballard were uh, about a month ago on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, looking at a different kind of hydrothermal system. So, so we are trying to study beneath two and a half kilometers of water how earthquakes and plate tectonics generate a flux, and we hope to quantify it eventually, generate a flux of chemical, chemical fluids and microbial output. We don't know whether that output, microbial output, rivals or is a tiny fraction of the productivity that's in the upper ocean driven by the sun. So this is a, a question that we ask ourselves, and some of the results have been fairly phenomenal. For example, we have some graphics that actually show uh, the earthquake activity that has taken place recently in a hydrothermal, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the ridge crest uh, that we're looking at. We are in what's known as the main endeavor field. Uh, the main endeavor field is one of five fields the five fields starting at the north are Sasquatch, Salty Dog, High Rise, the main field, and Mothra. Don't ask where the names came from. Uh, and we are in the northeast corner of the main field looking at a sulfide structure uh, named, named Hulk. So we're, we're doing some interesting studies in that particular area. But, but there are seismometers that are surgically placed around this area of the five hydrothermal sites. Those seismometers have been active for the last two years, collecting information about the seismic activity. William Wilcock and his colleague Doug Toomey and uh, Emily Hooft and uh, Paul McGill uh, and Tony Ramirez from, uh, from uh, Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Research Institute have, have been working with us to get that information in the can, so to speak. And there's a graphic that is probably playing right now as I speak uh, that shows the earthquake activity. And you'll see that each of the earthquakes actually kind of explodes. And that's the timing of that earthquake, OK? So what you're looking at is a 3D rotational uh, graphic that presents the ch time. It's, it's, it's a, over an entire year. You're looking at the time unfolding uh, through the year and the earthquakes that take place in, in space and time. This is very exciting because it allows us then to look at the fluids that are coming out above those earthquakes and say, oh, that particular set of earthquakes generated a change in temperature or in fluid fluxes or in microbial output. That's where we're headed. The biggest problem that we face in looking at those output fluids is that we're not out here except for about three or four months or three or four weeks at a time every other year. Now, 
uh, we we have begun to change the way we do science by uh, uh, becoming involved in a program that has been supported by the National Science Foundation. It's it's called the Orion Program, and the Orion Program is one in which the scientists associated with the oceanography portion of NSF have designed a suite of experiments that can be done remotely in the coastline, in the deep ocean, or in fact in, in uh, local regional areas to, to look at the time series changes without having to have human beings there. So what we're doing is looking using fiber optic cables in some cases, satellites like we're using right now to talk to you, to do remote science, interactive remote science. That is, we're able to use robots that are controlled by fiber optic systems like we have here, or that are autonomous, like the Abe system I mentioned to you, uh, and they can go off and do uh, uh, programs that, that we really initiate uh, from land. From my point of view, one of the most exciting components of this, of this Orion program is what's known as a regional cabled observatory, and I'm involved with some of my colleagues in developing a program that we call Neptune. Now, you don't have to remember this, but Neptune stands for Northeast Pacific Time Series Undersea Network Experiments. What it represents is an effort to instrument the entire Juan de Fuca plate and the overlying water column in order to have the ability to interact at any time, uh, day or night, 24-7, uh, 365, to look at the changes that are taking place. We'll have thousands and thousands of instruments associated, uh, hardwired to land, to the internet, uh, through the fiber optic cable laid across the, uh, uh, across the plate. There will be the power and bandwidth will be phenomenal. We'll have uh, uh, gigabit per second communications and we will have as much as 100 kilowatts of power. And this entire system will be hardwired to the, to the internet. Now, why do such a thing? The reason for doing such a thing is that we can then make the transition to doing our science all the time throughout the ocean. And there are some big processes that operate that cannot be studied by taking a ship and running out to sea whenever something happens. Sometimes we don't know what happens. So being able to determine that something is taking place is critical. And sometimes when we know what's happening, we can't get out there because the ships are scheduled two years in advance. We must, we must have this kind of capability in order to begin to truly understand the oceans. Now, what I'd like to suggest is that there are several other kinds of, of science that we may actually be able to uh, uh, conduct that would not have anything to do with Ridgecrest science, but would in fact have something to do with um, oceanography in a more general sense. Uh, that kind of science is the kind of science that would, uh, would might involve water column work. It might involve uh, new kinds of technologies. It might involve an entire new community of folks that actually uh, have not been very involved uh, in this kind of remote science in the past. But it's time for us to examine what those possibilities are. Now, a, a couple of those uh, are, can be articulated for you uh, by my colleagues to, to my left here. Uh, uh, Virginia Armbrust and Deirdre Meldrum are both professors at the University of Washington. And I'll let, I'll let Ginger speak for herself about one of the most, one of the major uh, issues we face in oceanography is what happens to the carbon. Ginger? Thank you very much, John. So I have the really uh, difficult task to yeah. drag you away from the hydrothermal yeah. vents for a couple of minutes and tell you a little bit about another program uh, that will be benefiting from uh, these Neptune-like programs that John was just telling you about. So with the first graphic that you see, we see the planet Earth. And that's where I'm going to drag you out to, is all the way out to our entire planet. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about carbon. 
And what I want to, the reason that I want to talk to you about the carbon cycle is because, uh, as one of our colleagues earlier told you, Pete told you, uh, we have to work amongst biologists, chemists, geologists, physical oceanographers, and the common unit that we all use is carbon. And so what I'd like to tell you about is the carbon cycle. What I'd like to start with is thinking about uh, the life on our planet, and we can divide life on our planet into two different groups. One group uh, Pete alluded to a little bit earlier. These are the organisms that can take carbon dioxide uh, and a little bit of light and a little bit of sunlight, and what they can do is generate organic carbon. This is, serves as the food for the rest of the life, life on planet. And in doing this, they also generate oxygen. Now, the organisms that we think of doing these kinds of activities the most are the plants that live on land and the phytoplankton, the microscopic organisms that live in the ocean. But you also just heard a little bit about uh, the microbes that live at the hydrothermal vents that are also doing chemosynthesis. So they're using this same kind of pathway, except it's being driven by chemical en energy rather than sunlight. So what I hope you can see here is that there are organisms that are using carbon dioxide, generating organic carbon, and in doing so, they're also generating oxygen, which is really perfect for those of us that fall into the second category of life on our planet, and those are the ones that, like us, that feed on organic carbon, and uh, we breathe oxygen. And in doing this, it allows us to live. And so what I hope you can see is there's a very intimate connection between the organisms that uh, generate or, uh, organic carbon, that's the photosynthetic organisms, and the chemosynthetic organisms that generate the organic carbon and the oxygen, and those of us that use the organic carbon as food and uh, breathe the oxygen and generate carbon dioxide. So there's a very tight connection between these organisms on our planet. Now, if we take this diagram that I just showed you, and instead think a little bit about, let me show you a schematic of the carbon cycle. Now, what you can see in this schematic is that there is photosynthesis and respiration that happens on land, and there is also photosynthesis and respiration that happens in the ocean. In addition, in the ocean, we see the circulation, which is moving the carbon through the ocean. And finally, what we see is that there is carbon dioxide that's in uh, the atmosphere, and it, this carbon dioxide is pulled down into the ocean as the photosynthetic organisms make the organic carbon that then fuels the rest of life in the ocean. We uh, know that about, at this point, about 50% of the organic carbon that's generated due to the photosynthesis on our planet, about 50% of that is happening in the ocean due to microscopic, the activity of microscopic organisms known as phytoplankton. So what the key point here is that microscopic organisms can have impacts on global processes. And in doing this, these uh, organisms that live in the ocean help, help uh, keep atmospheric levels of, of CO2 at uh, a, good, a good level, right? They help mod, uh, modulate the CO2 levels. If we didn't have uh, the microorganisms living in the ocean, atmospheric levels of CO2 would be much higher than they are right now. And let me tell you a little bit about what's going on with our CO2 levels right now. We humans have made a huge impact on our oceans. We've made a huge impact on our planets. As illustrated here in this graphic, we all love to live near the ocean. We love to visit the ocean and we love to live near there. When we do that, we have a huge footprint that impacts these environments. Uh, we have been burning our fossil fuels. Atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide that are generated through the burning of, of uh, fossil fuels are at the highest levels that we have seen for the last 420,000 years. Exactly 420, yes, I really said 420,000 years. The way we know that is that we are able to look at uh, ice cores. When ice is formed, it traps little uh, bubbles of air. And so we can go back, scientists can go back in time by going deep in an ice core and measuring the atmospheric levels of CO2 that are trapped in those ice core bubbles. We know that uh, for the past 420,000 years, atmospheric levels of CO2 have oscillated between about 180 and 280 parts per million. 
into the Industrial Revolution and the real impact of humans, we see that atmospheric levels of CO2 now are about uh, 370 parts per million. We have had a huge impact on uh, global processes. Uh, the rising levels of CO2 are leading to uh, increase in global temperatures. Increases in global temperatures impact ocean circulation, they impact ocean biology. Uh, we also know that about 50% of the CO2 that's been generated through the burning of fossil fuels has, since the Industrial Revolution has made its way into the uh, oceans and uh, it is acidifying the surface ocean. We can see those impacts already. Again, this will have uh, an impact on the biology. Okay, and so what, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, to understand these microorganisms and the way that uh, we are trying to understand these microorganisms to better understand how they're impacted by uh, the ways that humans are impacting the oceans is to use a new type of sensor that again will be uh, uh, benefit greatly from these Neptune-like systems. And this is uh, a sensor system that we call eco-genomic sensors that are based on DNA. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, my colleague Deidre Meldrum to tell you a little bit more about uh, how these sensors are going to work. Okay. Thanks very much, Ginger. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so we were talking about the environment and wanting to better able to understand it. And the ecogenomic sensors, what we're doing is taking advantage of the technology that's been developed in the Human Genome Project, such as DNA and protein microarrays and large-scale DNA sequencing, and using that to help us discover who is in the oceans, what are they doing, and how do they, how do they respond to changes, such as uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, phytoplankton, and changes in CO2, carbon, temperature, and so on. And so what we want to do is develop these sensors, and as you see in the slide, this has toxic algae bloom. And we can take samples of that through these ecogenomic sensors that are tied to the uh, Neptune cabled network. So here shows bacteria and plankton going through an ecogenomic sensor, and we can measure parameters such as the DNA uh, gene expression, protein expression, and so on. So these types of measurements are currently not available in the way that uh, oceanography is done today. So what we envision is that we'll have, with Neptune, the high power and a high bandwidth, and the ability to power and robotically control distributed sensor networks and so that we can sample in space and time or long periods of time uh, the parameters that we're interested in. So these robotic sensors will be equipped with sensors that can measure not only the ecogenomic parameters, but have that in correlation with the physical and chemical parameters so we can understand the whole process. So the development of ecogenomic sensors is currently underway and we're developing some of that in our laboratory at the University of Washington. Uh, and my laboratory is a genomation laboratory and also an NIH, National Institutes of Health, Center of Excellence in Genomic Science. We're developing microscale systems so that we can perform stimulus response experiments on single cells and we're doing this in real time. Our immediate applications are for health and medicine. We're studying HIV, cancer, inflammation, aging, and so on. But what we want to do is just develop that technology further so that we can use that in the ocean. Um, so on this visions cruise, we're in the initial stages of developing these sensors. We're performing some materials tests that will go into these sensor development. And then what we want to do is measure parameters such as the oxygen, respiration, and consumption rates of the microbes, measure their gene expression, protein expression, and so on. So to be able to do this, we have to take the sensors we've been developing in a very controlled laboratory environment and further extend that so that they can perform in a harsh environment in the ocean where the temperatures may be high, pressure is high, and then we have toxic gases and chemicals. So we need a lot of uh, development to make these ecogenomic sensors work. But the long-term benefits of these ecogenomic sensors are that we can then have a better understanding of the microbial populations uh, in the ocean, understand how they change, and also lead to discovery of new enzymes from the microbes that may lead to new drugs for medicine. So you can imagine in that about five to 10 years, uh, we'll have uh, the Neptune and these ecogenomic sensors, and we'll be able to understand how they work in the environment, and it'll be a whole new way of science and enable us to think in a whole new way. So I'm really grateful to uh, John here, Deb, and uh, Ginger. I've just been involved with this the last year. I'm an engineer working with biologists 
oceanographers and geologists, and we can really make some headway in understanding the ocean processes and how they interrelate with the processes on land. Well, you're not just an engineer, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm many things. Engineer, genomicist, oh, and genomicist. so on. Oh, right. <laughs> I, I, some of the nicest want, people I know are genomicists. How about a genomicist <laughs> wanted be? With engineering background. Yeah, well, well, you should become an oceanographer. We'll take, we'll take you to sea. <laughs> okay. Anytime. Uh, let, I, let's uh, talk. I, there's a, there's one more graphic. I, I hope you folks are looking at it. It's uh, it's um, it's a vision in some sense of uh, of a distant future, perhaps a distant future in which Peter and Dee Dee and Debbie and and Ginger will actually be able to do the kinds of science that they now do in the laboratory on on land, perhaps at sea. And what you see in that graphic uh, is a set of stereo uh, uh, high definition video camera systems that are set up on adjustable posts that can in fact move uh, in and out of a particular hydrothermal field like the one that Deb and Pete talked about earlier. That means with a gigantic arm, possibly on a mobile unit, that means that we can begin five to ten years from now, probably closer to ten, to actually conduct very sophisticated experiments within the ocean at the moment that the changes take place. So that when there's a big earthquake and there's a massive shift in the fluid output or, or the chemical uh, nature of the, of the vent fluids or, or any other kind of change that might have to do with, with currents or, or, or uh, giant storms or something like that, we will be able to do the analyses in situ immediately right away. Uh, with with some sophistication. Now, there's a that's a long story. We won't go into it right now. But one of the hopes eventually is that we will do oceanography in fundamentally new ways, not just on this planet, but much of what we're developing in our own oceans, looking at life as it's supported by volcanoes underwater. We hope will be applicable when we leave the planet and start looking at other planets. So I'd like to return now to the seafloor where Debbie has relocated with her colleagues here, uh, Bob, Steve, and Tito, have relocated both the ship. The ship has been moved subtly. You probably didn't even notice. Uh, it's been moved 100 meters in the last uh, 20 minutes. And we're now looking at a scene on the seafloor that is uh, uh, illuminated without the lights on our ship, on, our, on the, the uh, vehicle Jason, it's looking at a light tower that was prepared for us by uh, by Daniel Frenari at uh, Woods Hole and his ocean exploration uh, group uh, and has been lowered to the seafloor before the show. It is off in the distance and it is illuminating the southwest corner of what we call uh, a large self high structure called Hulk. It was originally named by Margaret Leinen, uh, currently uh, employed by the uh, National Science Foundation. And uh, she worked out here with us very early on, and it's called the Incredible Hulk. We are now going to fly toward that site. Uh, Bob and Deb will coordinate the movement. We will get closer and closer, and then Bob will turn on the illumination from Jason. Jason will then illuminate even more uh, vividly. Uh, the wall as we go up, the the wall of the of Hulk, and you will see then the sulfide. This this particular sulfide structure is about 25 to 30 meters in uh, in diameter, and it stands approximately 20 meters high. So it's roughly a six-story building. Really, is what we're looking at, and we're homing in a little closer now. We have the high def camera on. We're passing the uh, the light uh, post that's been put down, and I'm going to pass to Deb to describe to you as we go up the wall. I'll leave it to the two of uh, to Deb and to Buddha. We call Bob Buddha. Uh, we'll leave it to him to, uh, to to take over and and run the show, and then Peter Gerges will come in to share with you the most exquisite imagery that you're liable to see all day, which is the tube worm uh, colonies the that occupy the top 
of what we refer to as a flange. These are horizontal uh, ledges that capture water beneath them, very hot water. Uh, hopefully we'll see that, Deb will point it out. And as we migrate up the, the outer wall of this system, Deb will narrate and then, and then Pete will move in and uh, share with you what you're looking at uh, toward the end. Uh, following that, we'll be close to the close of our program. So those of you that are anxious to get to the airport can, uh, can be on your way very shortly. Yeah, so uh, what we're doing now is we're just starting up the side of Hulk. Uh, it's a remarkable structure. It's bounded uh, to its west side by a very large crack in the sea floor called a fissure that's actually about, oh, 30 some feet across and several feet down. And this structure is, just, is uh, we think that that fracture is part of the plumbing system, one of the reasons this structure is here. So we're very, very slowly migrating up the side of here. Uh, we're going to stop periodically and take a look at some of the animals. Um, again, the scale of you that you're seeing is uh, several meters across right now. So it is a very, very large chimney. Again, this is a black smoker system, uh, a single edifice that probably has multiple black smoker, smaller chimneys on top of it. And uh, over several tens of years, hundreds of thousands of years, we don't really have a good date on it right now, uh, this, this massive edifice has grown. Uh, you can see that on these uh, large flanges and bulbous shapes that there's a very rich community of animals that live on them. Uh, and so we're just going to migrate. The chimney in this area is about 19 meters tall. Uh, and we're going to zoom in now on one of these large flanges and take a look at uh, some of the animals that are growing there. One of the things that you'll notice, uh, if we can get a good view, there's a little smoker that we're going to be looking at. Um, and underneath these flanges, uh, we probably can't get a, a view, quite the right angle on it right now, but underneath these flanges, they're up like upside down bowls and they trap very, very uh, high temperature hydrothermal fluid that actually look like uh, underwater lakes or mirrors. There's a mirror plane under these flanges. So they're very hot pools of fluid that basically bound within a millimeter or so the 330, 360 degree fluid and the freezing seawater. So there's lots of little smokers that kind of dot these, these massive edifices uh, that are again are kind of the pinholes where the fluids are leaking out in these easy structures. So we, we'll spend a couple minutes here, kind of just, it's, they're really beautiful animal communities um, in this area. And we'll just spend a, a little bit of time uh, zooming in and out and migrating around the, the, the structure. At the very top of the, the uh, one of the pinnacles of the structure, there's a beautiful flange with very thick tube worms, bright red gills, and um, a lot and a nice some black smokers. So we'll we'll sit here for a minute and take a look at these two worms. Uh, they're very happy. You can tell they have red gills sticking out um, and lots of limpets uh, in addition. So Pete, you know. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Deb. And um, just to remind you all out there who are watching this program that this is coming to you live from the seafloor, and this is a pretty pretty extraordinary ex experience, right? Um, what really gets me is that. We're sitting on a ship and we get to view this live, but on top of that, you're all sitting in the comfort of your, your living rooms or, or your offices watching this live as well. What what you're looking at now is a community of, of uh, organisms that are uh, almost entirely dependent on the uh, chemicals that come out of these sulfides. So, uh, well, what do I mean by that? Well, what it means is that we here uh, on land often think about um, photosynthesis and how that's the, the uh, basis of, of our food chain, right? Uh, plants grow using sunlight and, and taking so carbon dioxide and made sugars. And then uh, animals eat the plants, including us. Cows eat the plants, we eat the cows, and you get the idea. In these environments, what uh, all of these organisms are dependent on bacteria that eat chemicals. So they're doing almost exactly the same thing that plants do. Uh, except they're not using sunlight energy because there is no sunlight here. Um, what's really, really fascinating is that these uh, communities, these areas of the seafloor have um, really, really high densities of animals. I mean, you can tell by watching your video screen, and that is a lot of critter uh, in one small bit of space, right? So what's out, for us scientists, we, we uh, often talk about biomass or how much uh, biological material is there. Well, the biomass at these hydrothermal vents is really similar to what we find in tropical rainforests. That means that there's just a lot of stuff growing here. 
Um, but there, this, these communities are dependent on these chemosynthetic bacteria. And a lot of the, the big critters you see are what we call macrofauna, the tube worms, um, well, which you will see once the dust kind of clears up here. A lot of these tube worms, um, not only are they dependent on these chemosynthetic bacteria, but they actually grow them. Um, what really sort of blew my mind when I first started studying these about, oh, I guess about 10 years uh, ago now, is that the tube worms that you're looking at, uh, which are the, um, the largest uh, animals on this structure, they, they look kind of like flowers. If there's a long stem and a little red plume on top. Um, you'll see them coming up on the right, right hand side here. These tube worms are uh, symbiotic with chemosynthetic bacteria. What does that mean? Well, that means that, believe it or not, this is where it gets really wild. These tube worms have no mouth or no gut, no digestive tract. They're sealed off bags. And what they do is they grow bacteria inside them. And the way they grow these bacteria is by providing the bacteria with the chemicals that they need to make sugars. So uh, this is an ecosystem that is really dependent on that chemical energy. But what's even wackier is that these tube worms are some of the fastest growing animals on the planet. And um, uh, my colleagues and I have been working on uh, uh, these tube worms down at the East Pacific, where they're also found, and as well as up here. And we're finding that they grow um, faster, uh, as fast, if not faster, than, say, bamboo or wheat, some of the fastest growing plants uh, on Earth. And to think that all of this happens, you know, a mile and a half or two miles below the surface of the ocean in uh, pitch black darkness is amazing. Uh, and not only is this interesting just from the uh, sort of pure science aspect of it, uh, understanding the origins of life and understanding how organisms function, but there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot, there is actually quite a bit of commercial interest in these environments as well, because these uh, organisms live on these really steep chemical and temperature gradients and they can they can deal with things that we as humans and other animals um, such as plants and, and uh, terrestrial animals can't so uh, a lot of companies are looking at enzymes from these sites trying to isolate enzymes uh, that will help them say detoxify a toxic waste dump um, so uh, these these uh, uh, are really uh, interesting ecosystems, both scientifically and commercially, but they're also uh, relatively fragile, so we have to be very careful about what we do down here. Um, so one of the things uh, that we spend a lot of time and effort doing is understanding which organisms come in and grow the fastest and which ones are the slowest growing, and that's sort of getting a better sense of the community and, and community succession. Um, now, Deb, you've been here, you've been studying this site for quite a while. I mean, what have you seen uh, in, in changes over time at the different... Um, structures. Sure, I think one of the most profound structures we looked at in, in terms of changes is a, a chimney called Sully, which is about oh, 200 meters from here. And we started looking at this Marv Lilly and others, um, John, in uh, probably 1995. Um, and we always were wondering about this one area because it was a, a large, basically a rubble pile of sulfide, a uh, lot of talus, big blocks of sulfide. And at the top of this chimney, it was very high temperature, a 380 degree smoker, incredibly vigorous uh, venting coming out of this thing, but there wasn't any animals. There were these little tiny things, they look like underwater spiders called pycnogonids, and that was the only real animal that we saw there. And we've been there for several years, and, and there just weren't any two worms or the normal communities that you see. And then in uh, 2000, after this earthquake, this magmatic event, um, now you wouldn't even know it was the same chimney. It's absolutely completely covered in very, very dense uh, two worm communities. And so to me, that's one of the most profound things was just in a, in a matter of a few years that, uh, you know, something that didn't have any life on it before is now completely covered. So um, I think one of the things that we can uh, do, we're going to, one of the, the animals that's on Sully is a very thick, uh, very um, healthy type of two worm. And uh, if we can find it right up at the top of this structure called Hulk, there's similar worms like that. So we'll migrate up here a little bit and uh, just kind of wander around and explore the, the top of this chimney. Again, it's a, it's a pretty amazing structure. And there's at least 20 of these, these large edifices uh, within this one field here. It's important to realize uh, that when, when Debbie refers to this as a chimney, it is really an ensemble of chimneys that have been growing together more and more for an unspecified length of time. We, we don't know how old these are. We have not been able to uh, pin down their ages. Uh, we, the, the life that clusters around them 
is the result of the fluids that are passing from two kilometers below the seafloor upward into the base of the structures and then diffusing out through the pores and the cracks of the sulfide structure itself. So the animals are, the, the microbes are actually tied up in the formation of the structure. And this is one of the things that Peter was alluding to, that there's a very complex system. It may very well be that the time will come when we will be able to use some of the enzymes to help extract metals from rocks in, in different ways. So there's, there, there's just untold potential here, but the basic issue is exploration. The basic issue is discovery. How do scientists conduct discovery in a world like this one where it's so difficult to gain access? Our answer to that, very simply, is we've got to be there. We've got to be there all the time, online, be able to react to changes that take place and study them thoroughly. Yeah, exactly. And just to sort of illustrate that point. Um, I started studying hydrothermal vents in 1994 after I finished my bachelor's degree and I went to grad school. And at that time, um, two weeks after I received my bachelor's degree, I stepped foot on a ship and sailed out here to the Juan de Fuca Ridge uh, and we didn't have email. And the, the telephone was a satellite phone that cost, oh, maybe $10 an hour or $10 a minute. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, we weren't, we weren't communicating with the outside world. We were um, here out here with a man submersible that would go to the seafloor, collect some samples for us. And eight hours later would come back up during the time that they were down there. We really didn't know what they were up to. And now here we are just 11 years later. Um, uh, talking to you all out in uh, out there uh, across the country and um, communicating not only in real time but also sharing with you the video that we're receiving live from the seafloor um, and if that is what you're watching now you'll see a lot of these small little black smokers that Deb uh, has been uh, telling you about and uh, what I think is amazing is is I mean I look at these and I instantly think wow boy why why don't we why aren't there a lot of critters on there and maybe Deb can can um, give us an idea of why that is <laughs> it's too hot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm not yeah. a biologist, Pete, yeah. but that would be yeah. my guess. Go with it. Go with it. What's going 300 on? 300 degrees <laughs> might be a little. It's toasty. pretty toasty. That's exactly right. Is that the right answer? That's a good okay, answer. Good. You pass. Okay, good. So the so um, although you maybe don't don't be confused here. Although the water coming out of these is 300 degrees Celsius, it doesn't mean these animals are living at 300 degrees Celsius. And the two worms that we're uh, showing you, um, I know from experiments I did on board ship that they'll they'll um, they'll die once they hit about 35 degrees Celsius. So, but there's a trick here. The chemicals that they need to feed their symbionts, their chemosynthetic bacteria, are plentiful in this 300 degrees Celsius water. The other chemicals that they need to feed their symbionts and themselves are in the cold seawater. So where do you live? Well, a lot of these organisms, organisms live literally right on the edge, right where it's just warm enough for them to kind of have access to both fluids, but not hot enough to, to literally literally boil them um, and so uh, you find that y when you look at these black smokers or the really really hot zones that they tend to be barren or devoid of animal life sometimes you'll see microbial mats there um, but more often than not uh, these organisms are found in areas where it's a little more uh, uh, moderate it's, it's like a nice warm bath and that's about as hot as it gets um, yes John <laughs> oh I just wanted to say that you're, you're now I think on on the high def camera, beginning to get a sense not not just of of the two worms themselves, but now as we're toward the top, you realize that although we're 19 meters high above the sea floor, back in the back, away from where uh, where we are actually can see in the foreground, are larger structures yet that have been built over over we think certainly decades, possibly centuries, and and these are analogous to the formation of metal deposits. Things like this, deposits like this, have actually been mined on the sea floor. Now, one of the things that um, is uh, a, 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 a sort of a wonderful experience for us all is to sit here and to watch this uh, live in real time. And um, this is an opportunity for you all out in the audience to, to start thinking too about these uh, uh, ecosystems and uh, uh, these systems as a whole. Um, we are, there are so many questions that are unanswered uh, and there's so much work to do and hopefully there'll be plenty of opportunities in the future when Neptune comes online uh, for you to participate uh, in, in this research. And uh, for example, what you're looking at here are a clump of tube worms that have microbial mat growing on them. And what is sometimes difficult to understand is 
how is it that these all grow in the same place? Um, so there's uh, lots of questions at hand, uh, and there's lots of work to do. And I'm going to pass it on to Deb to uh, share with us some of her thoughts on, on, on this particular site. Sure. So I think uh, one of our challenges, you know, we've been flying up this chimney. We're now at a uh, elevation of about, oh, maybe 20 meters up the chimney. And so we're sitting here with Jason um, and trying to figure out how do we ever manage these when there's so many microenvironments, how do we begin to understand them? And so one of the things that we've thought of is, is putting lots of different instruments uh, over these areas that do different things and really starting to get an integrated data set on on the chemistry and the animals and how they be, behave and, and interact. Uh, John, do you want to? So I think um, what we're looking at, we're, we're actually not even the top of the chimney right now. And uh, if we look off into the distance, you can see uh, another actually larger part of the edifice, uh, again, that goes up several meters. And one of the things that you see is you really start to get an appreciation for how much life is on these these uh, structures. There's lots of small black smokers that we see, and uh, it's a it's always a I don't know a gift for me to be able to work down here and, and see these things. That one thing I should say is this is the first time I've been here for over 20 years, and this is the first time I've ever seen views of a structure like this. We only get kind of a flashlight view uh, normally. And actually, this is the very first time I've seen a view like this for the for this structure, and it's it's pretty magnificent. So it's a it's a total gift for us right now. We're back, obviously, at sea. Uh, this it, all of what we did was in a very small uh, uh, control van uh, that obviously was in very intimate and close contact with the deep sea floor through the sort of the the miracle magic of uh, fiber optic cables from the ship vertically downward to the seafloor. In the long term, we expect to uh, have thousands of kilometers of fiber optic cables stretched across the seafloor with nodes, individual nodes, on uh, at the intersections of many of these uh, of cables. And we will have really uh, hundreds to thousands of instruments that will be distributed through the volume of the ocean, through the, across the seafloor, and deep into the subsea floor uh, in drill holes and, and the like that will give us a, a continuous presence. Uh, Bob Ballard used to call it a telepresence, and that's what we're doing here. But what we're really talking about is something fundamentally different than just a telepresence. We're talking about a three-slash-four-dimensional presence throughout the volume of the most dynamic part of our planet, upon which weather, climate, food production, rain, things of that sort, all depend. The oceans are really, as I mentioned it earlier, are central to the, to the, uh, the stability of our uh, life on the planet. And, uh, and we really must understand them, and we need new ways to do that. Uh, I emphasize as well that uh, a Neptune-like system would certainly be a, a bold step forward into the future. It would be something that uh, a number of other, we hope, countries and, and groups would pick up and, and begin to replicate around the world. We also think that the technologies that we develop us in response to that capability of remote sensing, uh, continuous remote sensing with miniaturization, with high-speed computers, with, with uh, data storage capabilities and the like, will be a very, very powerful export to other, other planets as we begin to export them. Finally, I think it's extraordinarily important to realize that the heart and soul of what we do is actually deeply and closely, uh, intimately tied to our technical capability of actually operating these sophisticated systems. The point being that without computers, without high-speed communication, without the cyber infrastructure, if you like, uh, that is essential to, uh, to doing everything that you have seen here today and more, uh, we don't have a prayer of doing this type of thing. So we are all focused on how to begin designing the best cyber infrastructural framework within which these new kinds of in situ, remote, interactive sensor networks driven by robots will actually be able to operate. So. I'd like to leave you 
at this point with the idea that oceanography and in fact environmental sciences in general are in transformation in transition to a new way of doing business it's essential that we make that move that move and it's essential that we do it as well and as quickly as possible I think the leadership that NSF and the Keck Foundation have shown in helping the scientific community move in that direction are essential. They're critical. Without it, we could not be moving down this path. And finally, simply because I can do it, I'll share with you one of my favorite poems uh, that was actually written in 1943 by T.S. Eliot when he talked about discovery. He talked about exploration. He talked about what humans do. And I think speaking for many of us, he said, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Arrive through the unknown remembered gate where the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the ocean, the voice of a hidden waterfall, black smokers, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, beneath the waves of the sea. Thank you for joining us today. We will hope to see you again tomorrow. And after that, we're going to go back to work as scientists. Visions 05. Expedition to the Underwater Volcanoes of the Northeast Pacific is a joint project of the National Science Foundation, the W.M. Keck Foundation, Neptune, the University of Washington, the Pacific Northwest Gigapod, and the Research Channel. Special thanks to the Neptune Ocean Observatory project partners and participants. Visions 05 Expedition Technical and Equipment Support provided by...